Welcome, deer hunters, managers, and enthusiasts. This is Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. My name is Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. Bronson and I are professors of wildlife management and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. Together, we've researched deer across the United States for more than 40 years. In our podcasts, we explain the why and how of deer management based on science. Whether it's research we've conducted or explaining research done elsewhere, we'll offer you a college course in the science of deer management. But don't let Steve scare you. This isn't going to be a review of calculus or chemistry. Instead, we take results of research, reduce it to what's important, and explain how you can apply research to management. So join us for this episode of Deer University. Welcome back, Deer Enthusiasts, to the next episode of Deer University. Today we are going to continue our discussions about the impact or lack thereof of coyotes on white-tailed deer populations, and predators, I should say, white-tailed deer populations, but we're mainly going to focus on coyotes today. We have a new guest today, a member of the MSU Deer Lab, that's not Steve Damaris, that is Dr. Marcus Lashley. And so Marcus joined us, uh, we're going to be coming on the two-year yep, mark in here, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So Marcus, uh, you're going to be speaking on the podcast quite a bit, so if you don't mind, why don't you just give everybody a quick little rundown of your background, where you're from, and what you're about. Sure. Yeah, as he said, I grew up in Alabama, and I loved hunting and fishing, and that got me interested in working uh, as a profession in wildlife management. And I came to Mississippi State uh, for my bachelor's degree and got more interested in continuing on. And then I went to the University of Tennessee and worked with deer habitat management in Upland Hardwood Forest, and that just... uh, made me want to do it more so then I I ended up at North Carolina State University and I worked in longleaf pine ecosystems with deer and coyotes and and uh, forest management and how those things interact and now I've come here back to Mississippi State very happy to be here and have joined the deer lab I guess as the habitat specialist uh, for game species. Yeah absolutely so that's that's pretty um, telling, Marcus. I guess your your projects resemble your interests. Definitely sure. you have a, a strong habitat component. Absolutely. And we are glad you do because you bring so much to the table with that, so much knowledge and experience. So, Marcus, one thing, Steve and I spoke on a previous podcast, mm-hmm. and and it was, it was pretty general what we talked about fawn predation yes. and fawn recruitment. So before we go into any more detail, in case someone didn't hear that, let me just do a quick rundown. First of all, the the biological term we use all the time is fawn recruitment. Mm -hmm. And and essentially that means it's a fancy term for how many fawns per doe are recruited Mm -hmm. into the population. And mainly we mean usually from a deer management metric when we're measuring it, is at least they make it through the winter. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know sometimes if they made it through the next summer and if they bred and all that stuff, but we know they uh, made it through a hunting season, they Mm -hmm. made it through winter, and that's what we call fawn recruitment. And so over the past 10 years, mainly, more in some situations, but of course there's been a lot of talk about the impact of coyotes or coyotes on fawn recruitment. Mm -hmm. Um, Steve and I shared with our listeners here that it is really uh, property or landscape specific. There's Absolutely. a landscape and habitat context mm-hmm. to whether coyotes are having a big impact. And a lot of the studies that have been done, you know, I'm thinking of three or four off the top of my head, have indeed, without a doubt, or at least without a doubt in my head, mm-hmm. have shown, yeah, coyotes are having a significant impact on fawn recruitment. That's that's absolutely true, and uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is coyotes eat fawns. Yeah. Two, our studies tend to be focused in areas where there's a problem already. Mm-hmm. So 
you're absolutely correct. Coyotes can have an impact on deer populations, but you are also correct in that it is absolutely context dependent. So when when we'll talk specifically about your study, but that, that's a great point I want to emphasize mm-hmm. again is, um, and it's not in any way to say those studies aren't valid in, in right. any way, shape, or that's form. Correct. But if you were to say, let's do a study on the impact of coyotes on fawn recruitment, you would take a random sample. Yeah. You would just put the blindfold on and put your finger on the map and let's go look here. That's correct. But those studies were funded because they knew there was a problem. We don't have any deer. We have, you know, and so, hey, let's investigate what it is, we think. And then they certainly, they confirmed that it was coyotes. Yep. So... Let's go, Marcus, to um, a little bit more specific about your project and how it fits okay. in into yeah. the, the coyote issue. So I basically want to talk about coyote predation in terms of habitat. So you imagine what a coyote is doing on the landscape. It's hunting for a fawn. So the harder it is to find a fawn, the less of them that it will eat, correct? So mm-hmm. we can probably all agree on that. Uh, but we don't often think about that. So most people are thinking the way to decrease coyote predation on fawns is to decrease the number of coyotes, which probably can be effective in some cases, but it's much easier to change habitat in many cases and affect predation. And, And just to illustrate that beautifully, I think, in North Carolina in the study that I was involved with, we basically measured the habitat characteristics of every bed site for 60 fawns. So a a big sample size in terms of what these studies operate on, and we followed where were those fawns bedding and what was the structure of the habitat around those fawns, and then what happened to them? Did they get eaten or did they survive and be recruited into the population? And what we found was pretty interesting, and this is, uh, this is the first evidence from deer and coyotes uh, that's, that's been published. So uh, we're pretty excited about it because it's going to change the way that we think about predator-prey dynamics between these two species, I think, and hope. Uh, Real quick, Marcus, catch yeah. the people up on it. They'll, they'll think this is interesting, the technology okay. you used. Yeah. How in the heck did you find these fawns? That is a good point. Fawns are hard to find. They and that's by design. They mm-hmm. have spots on them. What that is is actually cryptic coloration, and that's designed to help them hide. So in other words, they take a hider strategy. That's what a scientist would call that strategy to avoid being eaten or to avoid predation. So uh, that makes them very hard to find by design. What we used was actually a paired technology with GPS collars. So we caught adult female deer and put GPS collars on those deer, but while we had them, we also used what's called a vaginal implant transmitter. And it is exactly what it sounds like. We took a small transmitter and put it in the vagina of the deer, and basically it operates based on a temperature switch. So when the the doe has her fawn, she pushes out this transmitter and it warms up and then it changes in frequency and it tells us when we're monitoring it, oh, it's been dropped. So we go to where that transmitter is and normally, if we're there very quickly at least, the fawn will be in the close proximity to the transmitter. There's the transmitter and there's the fawn or fawns right So normally you would want to get within four hours maybe uh, of that transmitter falling and uh, we tried to give a little bit of time to let the, the mother fawn bond and uh, let her clean up the fawn and everything. But we want to get there before she moves it because there's, there's evidence that she could move it quite a long ways. And that she doesn't have to move it that far, especially if the habitat is good, before you're not going to find it. Yeah. So uh, we also, in some cases, we weren't able to do that. And we actually used thermal imaging successfully as well. So it didn't work very well in the day because... It's hot, mm-hmm. but uh, during at nighttime, if we were going into these transmitters, you know, we're we're monitoring these things around the clock. So it may be two thirty in the morning, and we're trying to go in and find a little fawn on the ground somewhere. So uh, we used a thermal imaging 
forward looking infrared mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. find fawns and and they stand out pretty oh well yeah at night. so yeah. it's a glowing little little uh little protein package yeah. for a coyote <laughs> yeah. good yeah. thing they can't see them yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> okay so like we talked about marcus there was, before your project began, there was a perception as well as some pretty darn good evidence that the deer population was crashing. That's correct. From, from hunter input and, and biologists yeah. on the site and so forth. Yes, we uh, we actually were pretty lucky in, in that on it was on a military base that requires all hunters to check in and out. And they have to check in and out every deer that they kill. They age and sex and get all sorts of, of measurements on these deer. Uh, they also run, uh, run ca- camera trap surveys, so they estimate deer populations year after year. And all of those data, no matter which way you look at it, showed that, that the deer density had declined somewhere between 50 and 70 percent in the last couple of decades. Coincident with this, were, yep. were there also indices of predator changes and by predators Absolutely. primarily coyotes okay. yes so in 1989 they documented the first coyote on the base which happened to be about when the population started declining uh, there was a small lag after the first one you know the first coyote can't eat all the fawns but the first coyote means that there are more to come pretty quickly mm-hmm. and by the early 90s they frequently saw coyotes and I would say probably in the early 2000s, the biologist would claim that that they would often, on a spotlight survey, for instance, see more coyotes than deer. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it just goes to show you deer went from being very common to coyotes went to being very common. They were seeing a lot of coyotes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, Marcus, that's a good setup there. So you have deer. You have this fawn, this protein package, and now mm-hmm. you have coyotes. Yep. Now, what is situated in between those is habitat. Exactly. So how on Fort Bragg was the habitat, you're doing the air quotes here, habitat or the, mm-hmm. the, the vegetation, how was it being managed? Yeah, that's a, a good point. So in the longleaf pine ecosystem, it's an ecosystem that must have fire. So that ecosystem evolved with fire. It was frequent on the landscape. And when I say frequent, I mean every square inch burned every few years at least. So we're talking about very frequent fires. It's also in the Sand Hills region, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's about 15 or 20 foot deep, depending on where you're standing, sand. So it's very poor soils. So basically... What they're doing on the base is trying to restore that natural ecosystem that functioned historically because there are a lot of other species that are dependent on that. And they were applying fire very frequently and because of limited resources and and other things, they were doing it in in a really, you know, not only frequent but also at a giant scale. Mm -hmm. So, uh, What kind of scale? 20 acres, 200 acres, 2,000 acres, what? Thousands of acres. Thousands of acres. Yes. Most We're talking people, about one burn at one on one day, thousands of acres. That's hard to comprehend in this day and age, isn't yes, it? Yes, <laughs> it is. And it, but it, you know, it's a necessary process, but just because fire is necessary doesn't mean no matter how you implement it, it's good. Right. So right. it's all, you know, habit, that's the thing about habitat management. It's very much dependent on how you, you do things. It's not just implementing a timber harvest to improve fawning cover. It's a, the way that you implement that timber harvest to improve yeah. it. So One size never fits all that is exactly habitat right. management. Yeah, which is a good thing, I guess. That's the reason we have a job. Yeah, it's going to keep this, you in business. Yeah, this is a, <laughs> this is a complicated business. Okay, so... Uh, trying to paint a picture here for the audience and characterize. So you've got a, a, a landscape that the, the vegetation can be sparse, Yeah. right? It's sparse yeah. because it's such poor soil on yeah. top of the frequent fire continuously is removing that plant biomass from the understory. And what I'm talking about with the understory, I'm talking about anything less than waist high. So... 
Uh, basically, the vegetation less than waist high is continuously being hit with fire, and mm-hmm. all of those plant species are adapted to that. Uh, but it creates a situation where the cover in most of the uplands for a deer is not very good. You may think this is dumb. And you feel free to tell people if you think it's dumb or cor- <laughs> correct me or provide a good chance scenario. That I think it's dumb if you're saying it. <laughs> um, Steve and I were, were talking about this previously, and I was again trying to paint the picture of what does it look like? What mm-hmm. does fawning cover look like? And, and I was like challenging Steve that if, you know, if, if, uh, he were to turn around and I had a basketball yeah, and I were to throw it as far as I could, which he joked about wouldn't be very far cause we're mm-hmm. getting old, but let's say it, I made it 15 or 20 yards away with that basketball. Be a good talk. That would be a good for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, if the he turned around, no, no flat, <laughs> flat ground. Um, if he could turn around and, and walk a few feet in front and look and couldn't see that basketball, even if it were painted fluorescent orange, you would consider that, again, just a general index. you got some cover on the ground. That's, that's a great visualization, yes. And that would be pretty high-quality fawning cover. Most people are looking at the wrong structure when they're trying to envision what cover is. So cover is visual obstruction so what you're talking about is a basketball being visually obstructed just like a phone would be if it was laying over there yep and we have a visual predator that's trying to find it so that visual obstruction is pretty important the problem is most people look at a a 10 year old regenerating pine forest as being excellent cover all that cover is taller than a coyote and the phone Mm-hmm. The coyote is looking under that cover, so you may not want to walk through it, but it's still pretty poor. It can be covered to a human being, meaning yes, I can't see an adult deer standing there. Yeah, you can't see a, an adult deer 50 yards away. But so useless for a fawn hiding from a coyote. Exactly, because yeah. the, the, the coyote isn't detecting the fawn from that far away anyway. Mm-hmm. So what's important is vegetation structure below waist height. So by, from from the, let's get back to Fort Bragg now. So if I were to go to Fort Bragg and heave a basketball 10 yards, 15 yards, however I were lucky enough to get it, you'd be able to see the basketball. In the uplands, in almost any case, you would be able to see that basketball. Okay. Another thing to think about is, you know, that's one way to visualize it, but it's another thing to go out and actually want to throw a basketball and then walk over and get it. If you don't want to walk over there and get it, a coyote probably doesn't want to walk over there to see if a fawn is there either. So it's that visual obstruction coupled with, you know, that tangle of briars and brambles that we all hate walking Man, through. We do that all the time as human beings. Yeah. We don't is, want to is do it that. worth it? Yeah. I want X, Y, or Z, but man, I don't want to go through that for it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that makes it even higher quality. And that's uh not the way the structure is by design in that landscape. Okay. Now, here's where I think anyway, uh, and you just had this published, so evidently you had some people in the scientific community agree that this was some pretty cool findings. Um, I think this is really, really interesting. So there at your study area, you have what is termed, or we term, uh, SMZs, so Streamside Management Zones. Why don't you tell people about what those are and what changes in cover there might be there. So a streamside management zone is, is a good way to put it. Basically what we're talking about is a little stream. So a, a creek or you know some sort of water source that continues to carry moisture. So Cr- what a creek for our northern Yes, yeah, creek. I, I would I don't know if I've ever used that term for anything, but creek is what mm-hmm. I would call it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we have a creek and we so the best way to put it is in most of the, the southern landscape, at least, we have streamside management zones that are often hardwood strips, and they'll have a buffer on that stream where we didn't cut the timber down, and then, you know, maybe 25 or 30 yards away from that stream, you'll start with the pines because we've planted a large, large portion of the landscape in pine. So that is a streamside management zone 
that SMZ of hardwoods that's sort of bisecting where we planted the pines. And that's designed to, in that case, to protect water. And, and the landscape that we're talking about is actually there for a different reason. So what is fire not like? Water, right? It doesn't do well with water. Yeah. If yeah. you have a campfire and you want to put it out, you pour water on it. Mm-hmm. Or some people do other things, but you know that's the, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> that's the good way to do it. So uh, yeah, so fire doesn't burn well when things are wet. So mm-hmm. as fire gets near that stream, water puts it out. Mm-hmm. So they light, you know, they light these fires and the uplands burn, which is completely natural. And then water puts it out near the stream, which is also completely natural. And you end up with a difference in structure because you have more moisture and you don't have as much fire. The plant community changes. And in that landscape, that plant community becomes extremely high quality cover for a deer in comparison to the rest of the landscape. So they don't worry about, in that case, putting in fire breaks. But the SMZ or the stream zone was... Yeah, they, so they do have fire breaks through the uplands, okay. but they commonly uh, allow the fires to burn to the up the stream. to the yeah. stream sign management. Yeah, zone. they okay. they actually allow them if it was dry enough, it'll burn through it. Uh, okay. But in most cases, it's not. So the fire is allowed to do whatever it would do naturally, mm-hmm. uh, which is normally it gets put out by the stream. All right. So now we have a situation where a majority. Of your, of your forest landscape has no or poor cover That's for falling to hide. And now we have these strips zigzagging all through the yeah, landscape. Long, long linear strips of excellent high quality cover. And now, the, okay, and so here's Mother, Mother Doe. Yeah. Yeah. It's time for her. What has Mother Nature taught her? What's embedded yeah. in her in, in, in yeah. instinctively yes. over eons is not to have a fawn in the wide open. That's exactly To right. go seek cover. Yes, she looks for high-quality cover, which is that streamside management zone in, in this particular landscape. Now, it just so happens for years and years before the coyote was on the landscape, that worked fine, right? Yeah, that was fine uh, before... The coyote moved in. But now you've created a situation where the coyote has easy hunting. Yes. So uh, another way that I like to think about this that sort of puts it into the context of what most landowners in the south or hunters in the south experience, uh, we pretty commonly will see a pine forest that has pretty poor cover if the, if the uh, forest hasn't been managed for wildlife. And we have these long linear strips of rights of way for, you know, a pipeline or, or a power line or whatever the mm-hmm. case is. And that structure in there, if it hasn't been mowed recently or they haven't sprayed it with herbicide, you start getting up pretty good cover about waist high. So a large portion of that, that power line, let's say, uh, has high quality cover so that's the same sort of scenario if you're not managing the forest around that you would create that same sort of bottleneck of cover this long linear strip of cover like that even uh you don't see this nowadays but marcus you growing up probably i know certainly when i was growing up uh, the same thing was created on fence rows this exactly. was this was before roundup and glyphosate yes that, that's yep. where you jumped to cut. That's where you jumped your rabbits, and that's yep. where you jumped your bob whites. It's on those exactly. fence rows. That's mm-hmm. where you had the difference in cover. Yeah, yeah. or you know the the border of a agricultural field, or your, mm-hmm. the border of your food plot, uh, mm-hmm. that edge where a lot of light is getting to the ground and the soil is being disturbed regularly. That's where you end up with that high quality cover. So, Marcus, what you found? I'm generalizing here, but you. It's a complete 180. It's completely counterintuitive. Yes. Until you understand that you created, in the fancy uh, scientific term, is you created a trap, like That's an correct. ecological trap. Yeah. Where you created a scenario where this mother instinctively goes where she thinks she's supposed to. Yep. Yeah. But she did something that's not advantageous for her offspring, yes. unbeknownst to her. So that's a good point. So uh, let's back up for a minute and talk about the strategy of the, the doe and her, and what she does with her fawn and 
you know, the, the behavior of the fawn. So it used, you know, in most contexts, it's good for that female to find high quality cover and place the fawn that's relatively immobile for the first couple weeks of life. So she wants to put it in high quality cover. It has spots, which makes it very cryptic. And the other thing that is pretty interesting about the behavior, actually, if you play a, a wolf call over a phone, it'll go into bradycardia. So basically it slows down its heart rate and it doesn't move instinctively just from hearing the call. So these are even in, you know, uh, pen raised deer, they still do that. So these things are ingrained in their their biology so it's that's really, amazing yeah it really I is even, i even know that and i'm still amazed when i'm reminded of i know it. it's yeah. just incredible so this is this instinctual behavior is very strong mm-hmm. so basically the the female selects cover that she thinks is high quality she places the fawn it has a cryptic coloration to help it hide in there and then anytime it hears anything it basically freezes. That's called the hider strategy. So they use the hider strategy to avoid being predated. So if you imagine uh, riding in a car, and we have state laws in basically every state, as far as I'm, I realize, uh, you have to wear a seatbelt because it saves people's lives when they wreck. It makes mm. the road safer. So we instinctively now, I do, I I get in the car and I put on my seatbelt before I drive anywhere. If you were riding down the road and that immediately, all of a sudden, the consequences of wearing a seatbelt switched. So you went from seatbelt save lives to people who are wearing seatbelts are much more likely to die. A lot of people would die from that. Mm -hmm. It would take us a little while to realize, oh, seatbelts are no longer advantageous. So that's sort of what happens in the wild when you create this situation. You have a behavior that's really ingrained into a a species like a white-tailed deer, and you change the context in which now that behavior all of a sudden is maladaptive. It takes a long time for for them to, to change that behavior. So if we if we think about the broader, you know, we have coyotes eating fawns, they used to use that behavior. Coyotes still kill fawns, but they tend to kill the the ones from mothers who picked poor cover, who mm-hmm. picked uh, maybe the the fawn isn't, uh, you know, we, they have personalities just like we do. Maybe the fawn is adventurous and it gets up and walks too early, and right. uh, it gets picked off. So behaviors that strayed away from that hider strategy get them killed in most scenarios. But in this case. It was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. The behavior that was supposed to be uh, advantageous now gets them killed. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to... I I, I may botch this, and it's okay, but when uh, you think about changing these behaviors, I'm trying to relate it to something humans we experience. And when we look at our diet now, and we're attracted to sugar, salt, and fat. Yep. And over time... That's really, really good. Mm-hmm. Fat has a lot of cacaos. Yeah. Fat's calorie storage. Uh, carbohydrates are energy. And, of course, sugar and sweets mm-hmm. is in rare, rare amounts in the landscape. And, again, more energy. Yeah. But now that stuff's in abundance. Yeah. Well, yeah, when we were hunters and gatherers, it, those things were rare in the environment. So we were you programmed to seek those things and exploit them. Yeah. Capitalize eat, yes, when you can. Eat all of it if you find any of it. Yeah. Which... Now, when there's a, a, an aisle full of candy that all mm-hmm. has that, those characteristics, that's exactly what I want to do. Yeah. I want to eat all of it. And no saber-toothed tiger is chasing you down <laughs> either. you <laughs> got to run from them. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's pretty cool, Marcus. So what, what you found and what, what you and, and your, your colleagues, it wasn't yeah. just you. You had a team, team yeah. of, of researchers working with you. Uh, that's pretty cool stuff. So... To me, what that demonstrates is even though you're in a landscape where habitat was so poor, habitat was still really important because the female, uh, it was a cue to her that this is where she's supposed to go. Absolutely. It just so happens 
the way the habitat was managed in terms of the fire and where those streamside mm-hmm. management zones, which are fire breaks, it caused this trap. Yeah. It enabled the coyote to find fawns very, very efficiently. Yeah. Um, what were your estimates generally? Were, were you getting 50% fawn mortality, 80% fawn? I think that we had 86% mortality on average. 86%. Is, yeah, that's one of the highest ever reported uh, mortality rates. And that was not all due to coyotes, but a lion's share of it was. So what, the, the, a little, the leading cause of mortality was coyotes. And aside with that, um, what, in, in terms of management of that population, had deer harvest entirely been stopped or had doe harvest been stopped? They, well, they had not completely stopped doe harvest. They had stopped uh, harvesting does from most areas of the base because just like we're talking about, this is context dependent on the landscape, even on the base. The base is a 160,000 acres or something like that. There were places on the base where the population as a whole is doing pretty well. Okay. You may have a 40,000 acre block where the deer population is pretty healthy. So uh, the interesting thing, anecdotally, looking at the landscape, the places that they were doing really well, they were the places where this this uh, habitat structure that we've been talking about, this trap, didn't seem to be there. Mm-hmm. So cover wasn't just relegated to... Those streamside zones. Yeah, we'd have yeah. other large patches of cover that are in irregular shapes and much yeah. harder to hunt. So let, let's think about that for just a minute. We have a situation that the coyote density, I have, I have not been to another place where it was as high as it is there, just anecdotally looking around. Now, one thing is you can see forever, you know, so it's easy to see a coyote. It's easy to see them. But yeah. they're also adapted to that kind of landscape, so they do really well. Uh, for you know, good reason. They they're eating fawns. They're eating small mammals. They can, they have fruit and all sorts of things that they're eating in that landscape. Uh, so they do really well. So you know, they ended up being pretty high density, but they were only a problem in the areas where the habitat structure was poor for deer. That's pretty cool. Pretty amazing, right there. So yeah. the importance of habitat. All right. So let's. Let's bring this back to um, what does this mean for people? Mm -hmm. What does this mean for your typical hunter, manager? Um, Marcus, can you paint a picture? So let's talk about even before we talk about some data collection techniques. um, What should someone be looking for like visually? Or we just go back to the basketball technique? They need to have... Yeah, I normally think about it in terms of a baseball. Okay. But basketball, that's a good visualization as well. Yes, if 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 you get a basketball and you can toss it out and still see it, then you probably don't have very good cover for for fawning right there. Uh, if you don't, if you can throw it out and can't see it, and you also don't want to go get it, it's probably pretty high quality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a very good visualization. So. Part of the recipe there, Marcus, is number one, you've got it. Now, number two is the arrangement of it. You don't want it to be in a linear strip. Right. So there's a a lot of things going in. There's a scale. So if you even if it's an irregular shape, if it's only a quarter acre, it's still really easy to hunt. Yeah, it's not enough. Yeah. So you have to make it hard. You need to think about this in terms of the coyote and how Mm -hmm. easy it is for the coyote to find a fawn. Mm-hmm. So the larger the patch is and the more irregular it is and the less visual cues that coyote has to key in on where a female might cue in on, mm-hmm. the harder it is for that, that uh, coyote to find it. So there's been some research that suggests that the fawn is actually scentless so that the coyote may not be able to smell it. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty interesting. They're visual predators and if... If you can obstruct that vision, the, the more that you do that, the less efficient they are. That doesn't mean the coyote's going to go away. The coyote's going to eat something else. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, um, and, and that has been, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, Marcus, from my perspective. So mm-hmm. I, I may have been looking at it this the wrong way, so please correct me if I'm wrong or you think about it differently. But that has uh, been a consideration 
that um, a lot of habitat-minded people have brought up is that if we start managing for this cover, or we yeah. would call early successional mm-hmm. vegetation, um, are we going to draw in more coyotes? Because if we have more ground cover, that means we're going to have more small mammals, we're going to have more hispid cotton rats, we're going to have more uh, blackberry and blackberry fruit and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, but, but what I'm gathering from you, and I guess what I believe to be true is that um, you are going to so far outweigh. Yeah? You could yeah. possibly attract some more coyotes, but but the good outdoes yeah. the potential bad. Uh, in terms of, so I can answer that in a couple of different ways. I, I personally don't have the, the uh, opinion that you would increase the number of coyotes on the landscape if you manage habitat for deer really well. For one, uh, you think about the stru- you know out in the west where coyotes came from, the structure that is there isn't the same as what we're talking about for fawning cover, at least not on the landscape wide scale. So, uh, you know, they're not necessarily adapted to do best in the mm-hmm. same thing that is high quality deer habitat. The other thing that you have to think about is you, you mentioned all these small mammals. Those actually dominate the coyote's diet. Mm-hmm. Small mammals do. Those don't include deer, not even small deer fawns. Yeah. Uh, when fawns are available, especially in a context where they're really easy to find, they may dominate their diet for a short period of time every year. But by and large, coyotes are eating mice. Yeah. They're not making um, their living. Yeah off a of fawn. So They're we actually did a diet study at Fort Bragg uh, where we did this research and uh, the coyotes, even though they were eating that many deer, they still, their diet, no matter what time of year it was, was dominated by uh, small mammals. Mm-hmm. And then a, a fruit was was pretty high up on the list as well. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty easy to, to catch a fruit. So yeah. Yeah. If there's a persimmon laying on the ground, you're going to eat that because it's a little packet of energy also, and it's really easy to catch. Mm-hmm. So uh, the other thing, the other way to think about that is when you improve the habitat for for deer fawning, you also improve the habitat for all those small mammals and things. And if a coyote is not necessarily adapted to hunt in that, it's probably going to be more efficient at catching something that's more abundant like small mammals and something they already specialize on anyway. Yeah. So uh, I, I agree that the habitat management part of it is much, it impacts the deer population positively to a much greater extent than it could ever negatively impact it by drawing in a few more coyotes. You know what I like of... Uh, to Marcus about habitat management is you get more ROI return on investment or yes. bang for the buck in deer, yes. deer terms here coyote trapping is um, and, and as Steve and I have mentioned in, in, a, in a previous uh, episode if I lease land mm-hmm. if I lease land from a timber company or, or a land or whatever and I'm like gosh I do not have not have any fawning cover there is no mechanism by which I can do it, then I may consider hiring a trapper. Mm-hmm. But it's every year. Yes. It's, it's an annual investment um, in, in both the, time and yeah. energy. And there actually have been a, a couple of very large-scale, really well-done uh, projects where they intensively trapped year after year after year, one of the studies for, for four years in a row. And you don't even consistently improve fawn crops when you trap yeah. lots of coyotes off the land. And we're talking about at landscape scales where thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of trapping intensively, and you still don't necessarily improve fawn survival from coyote predation. And that doesn't make sense intuitively, but mm-hmm. it's a reality. We're, yeah. we're just not that effective at increasing fawn survival by decreasing coyote populations. One thing that might put that into perspective for people we, we actually had GPS collars on coyotes in the same study. So I, I, I thought this study was excellent because we really, 
we had a pretty good handle on almost everything in the landscape. I was measuring plants. We had a student that was looking at movements of coyotes and diets. We had another student who was doing fawn survival. We're all working together on this, but we're trying to measure everything in the system, and that's pretty rarely done. Uh, but one thing that I thought was shocking was when we put that GPS collar on a coyote and then follow it, we had some that moved hundreds of, I'm saying hundreds of One miles. One zero zero S. Hundreds. Yes. Hundreds of miles in only a couple of months. We had a coyote at South, basically the Georgia, or excuse me, the uh, North Carolina, South Carolina state line. That's mm-hmm. pretty close to where our study site was. We had one coyote that moved all the way down to the state line of Georgia and then decided, you know what, I'm going to go back. So it turned around and then it settled somewhere in the middle of South Carolina. We had another coyote and just a couple month period uh, moved north, decided, you know what, I think I'm going to go to a cooler climate. So it ended up getting to Washington, D.C., or right there near it. And it was like, you know what, this is not for me. So it turned around. Not for the urban life yeah, here. It yeah. turned around, and I, I think it actually ended up getting killed by a car or something like that. But uh, my point is, when we're talking about trapping coyotes, you don't commonly think about, oh, I could remove this coyote. But that thing could have been two counties away yesterday. Yeah. Do you think it had an impact on your phones? And it no. may be four more counties away tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know yeah. if it's a resident. And yeah, and you don't. And, and uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think that trapping is, is the answer unless we're doing it at such a great scale that we can deal with that issue of you may trap a coyote today, but you may have one from the next state over tomorrow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And that is, to be fair, Marcus, the, the people that uh, – that recommend it, you know, yeah. and everybody we work with, they always recommend it with the right context here. But Absolutely. when it is recommended, it, it's not just doing it at the right scale. Yeah. It's also doing it at the right time. Absolutely. What you're, talking, you're doing yeah. it while fawns are being born. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's yeah. what uh, some of those studies I was referencing, mm-hmm. they were intensively trapping right up to yeah. to fawning. And, and sometimes it works, and sometimes you don't have the option of managing habitat. And I'm, I, I'm well aware of that. Mm-hmm. So uh, not all landowner, you know, not all hunters are landowners. So you, you may not be able to manipulate things to improve habitat. Well, Marcus, I want to uh, wrap up here with two things. I want to wrap up with um, what to do, get, give people some ideas of what they can do and where they can go. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe how you can tell if you got a problem because we've mm-hmm. talked about it in a previous episode. And I want to wrap up with you. What can you do habitat management wise what might be the best uh, techniques so Marcus what we've told people in the past um, essentially you have three traditional techniques to see if you've got a problem the mm-hmm. most most traditional is lactation mm-hmm. what, are, what are lactation rates and that is just what people envision it is um, when a doe an adult doe is harvested uh, can you tell if she is or did lactate and that is by uh, squeezing the udder or nipple and mm-hmm. is any milk expressed if not can you cut it open is there any fluid but mm-hmm. once you get the hang of that there's no mistake even if she has stopped lactating and there's not a fawn at heel you can tell if a month previous she had been lactating mm-hmm. so that's num- n- number one n- number two is hunter observations mm-hmm. probably one of the most neglected is people keeping track of what they see especially early in the season when Absolutely. it's easy to discriminate spotted fawns and, a, and you're adult You're going to be there anyway. That, that's right. Write it down. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we have an app for that called Deer Hunt. Yeah. Yeah, where you yeah, can record I use that it. stuff. There you you go. know why? Because I don't like writing things down on paper. So I have a smartphone sitting there, and I use that app to do it. That's exactly right. So we'll, we'll do a whole episode on how to use that, that app for, for management. Um, and then lastly, everybody has a trail camera now. Yeah. So it can be pre-season, during season, and it can be more tricky in the post-season. Mm-hmm. But running a uh, camera survey, you can get an estimate of fawn recruitment. And if they go to our website, msudeerlab.com, mm-hmm. we've got a tab there and a publication that goes step-by-step step how to set up a camera survey and use your trail cameras for that. Yeah. So that, Marcus, is how you determine if you have a problem. And I would say if you had multiple years 
where your fawn recruitment rate was below 0.5, that would mean that I'm recruiting half a fawn per doe, or it takes mm-hmm. two does on average to raise one fawn. Yeah. You either have some nutrition issues or yeah. some fawn recruitment issues with predators or something, mm-hmm. but you need to get involved. Yeah. And the thing about it is, Marcus, what's cool about it is if the habitat stuff I believe you're about to address mm-hmm. is going to improve both nutrition yes. as well as fawning cover. Yeah. So what so, are your typical tools of, of management for, for fawning cover? Uh, well, I wanted to talk a, a minute about, so you, you mentioned something that resonated with me, and that was it's a little trickier in that it's harder to tell a fawn away from an adult during the postseason. Mm-hmm. So it, it actually is also harder to get people to put a camera out then, it seems like to me. So I did a, another study where on we used the same study sites. With, we knew how many fawns on average were dying and how many females it was taking to recruit a fawn. So we had that actual on the ground. We also had that in a, a site in South Carolina with numerous years of data and another one in Georgia. Uh, we put all those data sets together because all of us had done preseason camera trapping surveys. So And camera traps for people at trail yeah, cameras. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a scientist. You know, yeah. We call it a camera trap. It's mm-hmm. uh, trail cams. Yeah, trail camera. Trail mm-hmm. camera. So uh yeah, the trail camera survey, we actually estimated how many uh phones per doe, or in the case of Fort Bragg where we did the study we just talked about, uh does per fawn yeah we had to measure it in because it was pretty bad but uh we had the known survival you know and and recruitment of fawns and then the camera survey so we used the camera survey to see that could we actually predict what uh predation you know had caused in recruitment so in other words we know what the recruitment is can we use cameras to estimate that so could the the average hunter use a trail camera preseason to estimate if there a problem and the answer was yes there was actually a high correlation what we did we took the number of doe pictures and doe pictures with the fawn and then estimated okay how many fawn pictures per doe picture did we get mm-hmm. so uh you imagine in a really healthy population you may end up with 1.5 or 1.6 fawns per doe that very be, healthy that would be doing excellent yeah so let's just say that's a one-to-one on fort bragg where it was so horrible one of the worst sites that's ever been measured we had one phone per 10 dose wow so one per 10 so that's like catastrophic end yeah so we're talking about the extreme ends of of doing well or doing you know horrible so uh, that's sort of the, the gradient we're talking about here. And you're right, I would, I would agree with you. Uh, somewhere in the middle, if you're below that middle point, you might need to step in and do something. It doesn't mean it's predators necessarily, but mm-hmm. it probably does mean it's a problem with the habitat. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the addressing the habitat can do either. So just to, to uh, I guess, uh, shorten that to make the point, the camera trap camera survey with a trail camera can be used effectively to monitor it year after year to see you know are there problems with with the deer population and maybe uh, you had a new timber harvest did that affect your recruitment rate or maybe uh, you know you implemented some new habitat uh, management techniques you can see am I actually improving that rate by looking at how fawn to doe ratios are changing so uh, yeah, I think that's a, a really important thing because it's a really easy way. We all like to see what the what deer are on the landscape anyway. You're mm-hmm. already going to collect that data. Just don't delete all the fawn and doe pictures. You yeah, know. that's exactly uh, right. If you keep those, you can you can estimate it pretty easily. If you do that year after year, you can look at trends in your own population like that. So yeah. I think that's pretty important, and especially when we move on to the next topic of managing the habitats. What are we talking about? I am not talking about planting food plots. That only addresses one component of habitat, which is nutrition. Mm-hmm. Okay, So most people are planting those to hunt over. 
and then secondarily have an interest in improving the nutrition of their animals. But what they're not doing is improving the cover. Cover is often, in my experience at least, limiting to deer. And the, the convenient thing about deer is because they're herbivores, meaning they eat plant material, they eat primarily leaves, which are also the thing that is driving cover. So if you manage for cover, you're managing for food also. So uh, I know we talked about the management of the landscape where we had the trap, Mm -hmm. and it may have painted a poor picture with fire, Mm -hmm. but fire is actually one of the most important management tools that we have. It's cheap, and it's very effective, and a lot of our landscape is adapted to to uh, have fire on it. Fire it can actually be used as one of the most effective tools to improve cover for deer. All so, right, Marcus. Now, let, let, let's clarify something because um, this was really important from your master's yes. research. Agree 110% with everything you've said, the importance of fire. What usually has to accompany that, though, yes. for it to be effective. That's, that's, uh, you were already headed that direction, yeah. weren't you? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because uh, my next point that I was going to make is exactly what you were alluding to there. If you implement fire in a closed canopy forest, it is not going to change anything. You have just lit fire for fun and did nothing else. You burned the litter up yeah. on the forest floor. So... We, you know, we normally think about these different things. I just talked about cover being limiting to deer. Well, what's limiting to cover? Light. Sunlight. Sunlight limits cover first. Plants can't grow in the dark. Mm-hmm. So if if it if there is not sunlight reaching the forest floor, a fire is useless. So first, you you have to break the canopy in some way. Now that doesn't mean you need to halt haul a uh, logging crew in and cut down all of your forest. That's not what I'm saying. You can thin or you maybe you you do some small clear cuts if that's what you want to do. You know, everybody's different in what they have available to do and what they want to do and, you know, so on and so forth. So uh, there are lots of different techniques. Another thing that I like to do is called a, a hack and squirt. Mm-hmm. So you can actually go in, maybe you have a few trees that are, are not desirable trees. You, know, you have a red maple, yeah, it's got pretty leaves on it in the fall, but really all it's doing is catching sunlight. It's not really helping the habitat or uh, any wildlife food for that matter. Uh, so that big tree, you know, it also isn't very valuable. So, you know, you could just hack it with a hatchet and then squirt a little herbicide in the wound and kill that tree standing. That snag actually produces pretty good habitat for a lot of other species. Mm -hmm. But the key thing for deer that it does is allow sunlight to get past that tree to the forest floor. So if you do small patches of those and you kill a few trees here and there, you can create this patchy landscape of sunlight getting to the ground. So if you couple that with fire, then fire augments the yeah. the habitat that come that responds to that light. So just to put that into perspective, uh, in hardwood forest in Tennessee during that study, we had about a hundred pounds of forage per acre available. When that was in closed canopy hardwood forest, no sunlight reaching the ground. Uh, you know, most of you have probably walked around that type of stand. We love doing it because there's no obstruction whatsoever. Oh, yeah. You can walk you around. You love to hunt in a stand yeah, like that, too. You can see for 300 yards. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's beautiful. And uh, during the f- fall, when acorns are falling, it, you know, deer are attracted to it. So there's no doubt about that. But in terms of cover for most of the year and food for most of the year, that's pretty poor. Yeah, terrible. So, yeah. So 100 pounds per acre is sort of our baseline. If you implement a thinning treatment where you cut down about half of the trees, so now we have about 50% of the canopy is open and letting sunlight to the ground, that increases your, your forage production to maybe 400 pounds. You know, about four mm-hmm. times. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty good. Absolutely. Uh, so... If you only implemented fire in that, you don't. You may get nothing, but in some cases you may get a little bit of a bump because you'll end up with a few plant species that might move in. 
but by and large, you end up with about 100 pounds again, somewhere between 100 and 200. So you could double it, depending on what kind of plant community you have. Uh, but for the most case, you didn't get that much out of it. However, if you do the thinning, where we got 400 with just thinning, and then you implement fire after that, now we're talking about 1,000 pounds per yeah. acre. An order of and magnitude. We're, yeah, change. we're talking about a year after that happened, mm-hmm. 1,000 pounds. So, yes, an order of magnitude. So the fire augments the light. Light is most important. But fire augments that. And then if you implement it on a three- or five-year rotation, I'm not talking about burn your whole property. I'm talking about burn some patches. You know, maybe you burn a patch every year, and mm-hmm. you have it on a rotation like that. You always have patches of high-quality cover, which is generally two to three or four years after fire. Sunlight gives fire the opportunity yeah. to create cover. Yep. So just fire behaving by itself isn't going to do it. It's got to be coupled with the landscape where sunlight can give it the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, Marcus, you and I, well, I'll speak for myself. I have a big bias to I'm always in hunting, working in a forested system. But uh, old fields can be an opportunity for for habitat management. People who have ever mowed during the early summer know that deer like to lay fawns in old fields. Mm -hmm. Those can absolutely be fantastic. Immediately, it should be obvious there are no trees there. That's why it's an old field. Mm -hmm. So light is no longer an issue. Now it's about disturbance, which would be fire. You can also, in that case, use disking. Now notice I didn't say one that most people use commonly, and that's mowing. Mowing does not promote a structure generally that is desirable for fawning. So the disking, so basically breaking the soil, generally will promote species, plant species that move in that are really high quality cover for a lot of wildlife species, but also deer trying to fawn and the mother trying to consume enough high quality stuff to eat to produce milk for that bedding fawn. You know, all those sorts of things are improved dramatically by by uh, disking or using fire so light's no longer a problem but uh, the mowing it can be used to you know we use it all the time in pastures to to keep them in pasture it can be done in that same case it's probably better than never doing anything because it'll just grow into a forest Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah that's generally not recommended yeah, and you know when, when you can look at the structure after something that's been mowed, mm-hmm. it looks nothing like something that's been dissed and you walk away. Yep. Or it's been burned and you it yep. takes on a completely different composition mm-hmm. that's more heterogeneous or you know yep. more mixed up in both in terms of the space and yep. the height. I mean, it's it's natural. Yep. It's well, natural. That, you know that's a that's a good point that you're making. You know, in a, a grass pasture, all the grass looks the same. Yeah. So your fawn that has a cryptic coloration is that coloration is really effective whenever you have a lot of different kinds of plants because they have all kinds of different shapes and creating different light uh, penetration mm-hmm. and you know that that creates that mosaic of color that they blend in really well with in a field full of grass that's not that's not as effective. Let me um, let me wrap up with one thing, Marcus. I think this will be important to, to um, take home message for people. There, there's a lot of information out there right now of kind of what you were describing earlier. If I'm going to punch a hole, let's just say, punch mm-hmm. a hole in the forest that's yep. uh, two or three trees and, and I end up with this great little spot that's uh, 15 feet by 20 feet or 10 feet by 15 feet or whatever, and it might make a great little place... For a deer to walk by and browse on some mm-hmm. blackberry or smilex, it might be a great place for an adult doe or buck to bed down. Oh yeah. Let's distinguish what. So so that's kind of like you're providing food and cover for adults. But if we really we have diagnosed and had some experts, our state wildlife agency may be giving us advice too, that you got a fawning fawn recruitment problem. Mm-hmm. What type of scale do you usually think of then if I'm going to manage a forest? Are you thinking that I need patches or areas that are now acres? 
let's go to an acre scale yeah, or more. Uh, it depends on what you know what the landscape looks like, and and uh, you know that's the problem. It always depends on everything, sure, because all these things are context dependent. But I'm generally, you know, like we were talking about the old field. I'm generally thinking about a couple acre field. Okay, would be a really good place. And I'm not talking about just one for your hundred acres. I'm talking about a few of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm generally thinking in the scale of acres. Okay. When I'm talking about fawning. And you want them, like you said, Marcus, all over the landscape because these does yeah. have home ranges and they have territories yeah. and yep. they overlap somewhat. Right. But you want all these patches of fawning well, you, cover. Yeah, and you don't want that one patch to be a grocery store for coyotes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, I just wanted people to have some sense of, mm-hmm. if you're going to undertake this, what kind of sure. scale does it mean? Thank you, Marcus. Episode number one of many, many, many to come. So mm-hmm. everybody's going to be interested to learn all about your uh, research here at Mississippi State. So I think we'll, we'll conclude right there, and thank you for joining us today. All right, thank you. We're glad you joined us today and hope you learned something valuable about deer management. If you have questions about this podcast or a question about a topic we haven't discussed, please log on to msudeerlab.com, click on the Deer University tab, and send us your questions. We'll get to them as soon as possible. In closing, we want to thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. We also want to thank the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowments that support deer research and education. Thank you.